รับเกียรติจากทาง GE นะคะแล้วก็มีทางผู้บริหาร GE มาร่วมด้วยนะคะเดี๋ยวเราก็จะได้ทราบกันนะคะว่าสิ่งที่เราได้พูดถึงเรื่อง 4.0 ไปนะคะสิ่งที่ GE ระดับโลกเนี่ยเขาทำกันนะคะเป็นบริษัทขนาดใหญ่แล้วเขาคิดว่า disruptive technology disruptive economy ต่างๆเนี่ยเขาปรับตัวยังไงบุคคลท่านนี้นะคะเป็นคนทำ strategy เรื่องนี้นะคะก็คือก่อนหน้านี้คุณบิวนะคะ Uh, let me introduce them in Thai first. ก่อนหน้านี้คุณบิวนะคะอยู่ Cisco แล้วก็ทาง GE เนี่ยได้เชิญคุณบิวนะคะมาอยู่ที่ GE นะคะเพื่อที่จะมาทำเรื่องของ disrupt นะคะว่าคือเขาเห็นเทรนของ Uber เห็นเทรนของ Google เห็นเทรนด์ดัตเบสเยอะแยะนะคะแต่สิ่งที่ GE เดิมเนี่ยธุรกิจเดิมของ GE ก็คือ Electric จะเปลี่ยนยังไงนะคะให้ GE ทันแล้วก็สามารถดำรงอยู่ได้ต่อไปนะคะอันนี้ก็เป็นคอนเซิร์นของทางผู้บริหาร GE ก็เลยได้เชิญทางคุณบิลเนี่ยเข้ามาร่วมในองค์กรนี้นะคะแล้วก็ได้มาทำกลยุทธ์ในเรื่องของดิจิทัลโดยตรงซึ่งคุณบิลเนี่ยเป็น CEO ด้านดิจิทัลนะะแล้วก็รันโปรแกรมระดับ global นะคะอันนี้ก็เป็นโอกาสดีของเรานะคะที่จะได้ฟัง strategy ของเขานะคะว่าบริษัทใหญ่ระดับ GE เขาได้เปลี่ยนแล้วก็ transform ตัวเองอย่างไรนะคะได้สร้างเทคโนโลยีอย่างไรนะคะก็เดี๋ยวเราจะให้คุณบิลได้เลคเชอร์กันนะคะโอเค Top executive student, are you ready? Okay. We have a special guest from GE. Uh, his name is William Ru, or we can we can call you Bill, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Yeah. And it's it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. William Ru or Bill. William is CEO of GE Digital as of September 2015. He joined GE in 20. 2011 to establish industrial internet strategy and to lead the conversion of the physical and digital world within GE globally. And in this role, he focused on building out advanced software and analytic capability, as well as driving the global strategy, operation, and portfolio of software service across the GE business around the world. And so this is. Our pressure, Tipcot 11. He is the first time of him to be here at UTCC and Tipcot, and also he play an important role in establish the internet uh, with our government, academic, and industry leader by setting the standard and best practice for the industrial internet. And now I believe we feel excited. So today we will give a lecture in the topic of digital transformations, and please give a big round of applause to welcome Mr. Bill Ru, Mr. William Ru or Bill. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. It's an honor to be talking to the business leaders and business community uh, here in uh, in Thailand. So. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a real pleasure for me uh, during my, my visit. Uh, what, what I really want to talk to you about is I joined GE seven years ago and we really uh, looked at uh, what kind of transformation is GE have to make uh, in order to be successful in the next 20 years. And uh, because we began to see that the traditional methods and mechanisms uh, that industrial businesses had used for the prior 20 years were starting to uh, not be as effective in order to be able to be a highly productive uh, industrial firm. So GE had been great at lean, GE had been great at Six Sigma, and we found that those were no longer the cornerstone of what was going to drive our own productivity. We also saw that our customers were changing how they were operating and using our equipment, 
and they were taking the data off the equipment and using it to figure out how to operate it more effectively. And we felt that it was up to us to become the best at helping them use our equipment and the data to make their operations more effective. So what we see is a change where digital technology was going to change how we operated our business and how our customers were going to operate their businesses. But we weren't ready. We weren't a digital company. So I want to talk to you about what we've learned in seven years to become a digital company because we believe that every industrial firm had better be a digital company or they will find themselves at a disadvantage to be able to compete in the world. So I think a lot of people feel that uh, industrial firms, nothing to do with digital. But I can remember in 1995 when Walmart didn't feel being online and doing online retail was important. So a small company called Amazon started selling physical books. And they said, oh, they're just selling physical books. They're never going to sell anything else. And over 15 years, Amazon has surpassed Walmart in their ability to win in retail. So at the time, all physical retailers in the early, in the mid-90s said, no one is going to buy anything online. No one's ever going to use a credit card online. That's not how people shop. We've talked to our customers. When you look at the entertainment industry and you think about uh, the, the way we used to uh, see entertainment, and maybe not for us, but our, our children probably watch, I know my children, they watch TV differently than I did. And they get their entertainment differently than I did. And so now the people who make money in retail are different. The people who make money in advertising are different. And the people who make money in entertainment are different than they were 20 years ago. And the ones who figured out how to use digital are the ones who won. Today, we see a lot of companies say, I don't have, that's, those are different businesses. I'm not in entertainment, I make cars. But what we're seeing is that every business is going to be impacted by digital and only those, and you have to ask yourself whether you believe it or not, only those who make digital a core competency will win. And the rest of them will find themselves at a disadvantage. And it doesn't mean they'll go out of business but it does mean they will not be as profitable as they were before. And we believe, or I believe specifically, that automotive is the next industry in the next 10 years. That unless you're a digital automotive company, you will not be able to compete with those who are. And I want you to think about this. Autonomous driving is in the very early stages. And autonomous vehicles, it's all software. A little bit of hardware, but whoever owns the software for an autonomous vehicle is going to be the winner. Because in the future, those vehicles will exist. Now the question is, do you buy a car anymore if you have autonomous vehicles? And if you make cars, do you sell cars or do you sell the service? And this is going to be the question most automotive companies are facing. The other thing that's happening is the cost of manufacturing those cars, we are seeing where new companies are being made every day to make cars. So the fact is what a car company is going to be in the future and who makes cars is going to be based on who has the best software to be able to drive that car and who has the best business model using software to deliver that car. And if you're not in that business, you will find yourself at a disadvantage. The same is true for everything. Every industrial firm in the world will suddenly find themselves at a disadvantage if their products don't have digital, if they don't deliver new digital capabilities to their customers, and if they are not able to compete digitally in the world. 
The problem is that if you say, well, I don't know what that means, I'll wait. My old boss, John Chambers at Cisco, used to say, if uh, by the time it's obvious, it's too late. So if you want to be an on, let's face it, online retail, you can make billions of dollars going online retail. Why isn't everybody in online retail? Because Amazon, Alibaba, and others have already won. And it's hard for a Walmart to even catch up. So they had to buy a company called Jet and pay a lot of money to be able to even have an opportunity to compete. So one thing is if you aren't early enough on in this, you will find yourself at a disadvantage. Now the good news is it takes 20 years. It took 20 years for Google and the Facebook and others to overtake the advertisers. It took 20 years for Amazon to become as dominant as they are. So it takes about 20 years for this to play out. So the good news is we're only at the beginning of the next 20 years in these markets. We're only at the beginning in financial service as that changes. In some of these markets, we're very, we're, we're, we've moved and matured a lot. So this is going to happen, and all businesses have to be digital. And the thing you should think about is the ones who are going to win are going to realize that they have to develop a compelling user experience, and they have to use software in a way that their companies aren't ready for. So GE decided seven years ago to become the first digital industrial firm. And I want to talk to you about what that meant, what we learned, and what we think every company can learn from this, and what it takes to be able to be a digital leader. So that's really what I want to talk about. And I think it doesn't matter whether you're in government, you're in business. You've got to begin to think about this for your business and for your country. I leave you one last thought before I get off this. I think you just had a talk on Industry 4.0 uh, and, and, uh, and a number of topics like that. If you think about what Germany is saying, Germany came out and said, Industry 4.0 at the government is our policy. Now, why did they do that? Because they said, as a country, we are going to win the digital battle for the industrial and manufacturing world. And they said, our policy is to enable our manufacturing companies to go digital. Our policy is to teach and lead our manufacturers to go digital because Germany believes in order for them to be dominant in manufacturing, they have to be dominant at digital manufacturing. And Industry 4.0 is a policy by the government to ensure that their manufacturers are well positioned in the future. So when I say this is, we see governments around the world coming up with digital policies to enable and help their businesses to compete. We see businesses deciding to own and operate this and win. And we see, uh, you see universities beginning to, to teach courses on this idea of digital transformation. When we started seven years ago, most people said, we don't, need, we don't know what digital and industrial means. You guys make jet aircraft engines. You make gas turbines and wind turbines. You make CT scanners and MR scanners. Why do you need to do digital? What, the, what does that have to do anything with great manufacturing of these products? You make great products. Just continue to make great products. But we really thought through the idea that we don't just sell a product. When we sell a jet aircraft engine, that engine is used for 20, 30, sometimes 40 years. And it gets operated and maintained over that period of time. And we began to understand that a customer is going to use digital to better maintain a jet aircraft engine. And if we provided digital tools to see the data, to understand and guide them when to fix it, we would be better positioned with our customer to both sell them more jet aircraft engines, service more jet aircraft engines, and be their best partner. Because it isn't just about selling the product. It's about what happens after the product. So for us, we realized that digital was going to allow us to help our customers operate their machines at a lower cost than our competitors. 
So that became our thought process. We started to talk about this, and eventually the World Economic Forum started to say, OK, what does digital mean to industrial? What's going to happen? And what the World Economic Forum said is that this is the trend for every industrial firm. They are going to use digital to enable productivity in their businesses in a way that hasn't happened in the last 25 years. And they have said that the value of this digital trend is $6.8 trillion. And I'll give you some, some numbers. If you, can, uh, if you can operate power plants around the globe and get 1 to 2% productivity and efficiency out of the power plants in the world through digital, that alone may be worth as much as half a trillion dollars a year. Just 1 to 2% globally of all power plants operating more efficiently. If all airlines could get 1 to 2% greater efficiency in the fuel burn rate, you can again see this idea of hundreds of millions of dollars that's available to them. So when we talk about this efficiency gain, the 6.8 trillion is what they believe is the opportunity between how businesses operate their machines today and if they could operate them at a higher level performance using digital technology. So when we talk about digital and industrial world, what we're seeing is it means three things. It means you can take a machine or an asset and using digital technology, using data, you can analyze and operate that more efficiently. A good example of this is a wind turbine. So we provide software now that looks at the wind at a wind turbine and optimizes each wind turbine individually. We can generate 5% more electricity by adjusting each wind turbine specifically for its specific wind. 5% more electricity on a wind farm is 20% more profit to the operator of a wind farm. Now, if someone came to you and said, I'll help you generate 20% more profit, would you be interested in that? I think probably so. And if they said, OK, here's how we do it. We do it through software, you might not believe them. But essentially, that's what we're talking about in the 6.8 trillion, is the ability to make an asset perform better, more efficient. It's, so think about a power plant, a chemical factory. Think about a manufacturing operation. Think about any particular oil field. Think about a retail location. This is what we're talking about. Once you've got the machine operating better, you can operate your whole plant better. So if I can make my machines work in a power plant better, can I make the full operation work better? Yes. And then finally, what we're seeing is new business models appear. And I'm going to talk about this. But the way we see digital happening is you make your machines better, you make your operations better, and then you provide new business models. And that is worth $6.8 trillion. And this is what we're seeing the leading companies in the world do today, is to say, I'm going to use digital to compete in a totally different way. Interestingly enough, what we're seeing is that this is not something that is done in Silicon Valley. This is done on a global basis by companies we wouldn't expect to do this. So when I travel around the world, great examples of this is South 32 is a mining operation in Australia. And they are using digital to change the mine where they can operate everything remotely. So instead of having the person drive the truck at the mine, the truck is driven in a nice, comfortable room, uh, hundred, literally hundreds of miles away. It can be done cheaper. It can be done easier. The person who mans the crusher or the grinder, it can be done remotely. So we're seeing mining. You can change fundamentally the cost of running a mine by thinking about how to do it in a remote operational fashion. And by the way, you make it safer. We see. Uh, Gerdau Steel in Brazil 
is saying the only way I'm going to compete with Chinese steel manufacturers is to be able to lower the cost of production. And so they're realizing the way they compete is going to be through this idea of transforming this in every factory. And can they drop the cost down to where they can compete? Well, yes. If you can go fully autonomous, you can change it so they, they're going to have to compete with you. This is the Kazakhstan Railway. And what they realize is that rail operators no longer think station to station. They've got to deliver door to door to be able to compete. Because nobody wants to deliver to a station. They want it picked up and delivered to their customer. And what happens in between doesn't matter. And so logistics will be changed going forward as we think about this. So we see this as a global phenomenon that can be done anywhere, anytime. We're seeing countries like China come up with their, their policy to lead in this. So they've embraced our terminology, the industrial internet, and said they want to lead in it. We've seen Germany do it with Industry 4.0. So global countries, this is becoming, we think, at the forefront of what's going to determine how fast your GDP grows in the future uh, in, uh, in anywhere around the world. So a few more slides, and then I'll open it up for questions. How does a company go on this journey? What does it mean to be digital? What we've learned is this. For an industrial firm, it first means you're probably going to need to connect your machines. You're going to connect the wind turbines and pull data off it and analyze it. You're going to connect the machines in your power plant, in your oil field, in your factory, and you're going to take the data off that. Now, that's not interesting. What is interesting is improving, improving availability and reliability. What is interesting is improving the predict productivity, safety, and efficiency of the people. So the idea is not to connect and have data. The idea is to set operational performance metrics, outcomes, and try to achieve those. I want to spend 20% less labor cost in running my plant. That's what we do in our manufacturing facilities. And we've say, we're now finding a billion dollars of savings every year, an addi additional billion, in our plants and our supply chains. Because we think about, I want to cut the time it takes to manufacture this by 10%. Now, we only may get 8%, but that's pretty exciting to receive that. Once you've done this, then you start to move into optimizing operations. Now, what do we think about here? For example, what we see is in the utility space, if you've connected all of your machines, you can now operate your grid in a new way. You can create a dynamic grid that you can change and make it much more efficient than ever before. We see the idea that you can do dynamic forecasting and modeling as a power operator to optimize energy trading. You could never do this before because you didn't have the data. But the ability to optimize energy trading because you can see price fluctuating, and in real time, you can change the nature of how you produce power to generate more at a time when you can trade it at a higher rate. That is the idea of what happens here. At this level, new business models, what we see is people rethinking how they sell and what they sell. I'll give you an example of a, a traditional company that makes, is in the making uh, rubber-based products. So think of belts for mining. So in the old days, they make, they'd manufacture the belts, they'd go in and sell a belt, and they would compete on the idea of my belt has is is, is got these properties and their belt doesn't. Right? They're rethinking their business to where not only ha are they manufacturing it differently and optimizing their process, but instead of selling the belt, why not come in to the mining operator and say, I'm going to sell you a guaranteed performance. I'm going to guarantee the belt's always running. I'm going to monitor the belt while it's running. 
and I will ensure the belt is, uh, it never breaks. Now with this technology you can do that, and by the way, you can charge a premium because the operator of the mine has less of the cost associated with running that crusher and a guarantee. So if you can guarantee and you can arbitrage the uh, inefficiencies of operating it, you can get paid as a service. So you no longer sell a belt, you sell a service. And anybody selling a belt without the service is at a disadvantage because once you bought the service from them, you're saving money and you're never changing. And if they can't offer that service, they can't compete. That's digital for a rubber company. Changing how they sell and what they sell to their customers to give them a solution they could never ever have before. And what's the value of guaranteeing the belt never breaks? If you take a uh, liquefied natural gas producer, an LNG plant, the biggest ones in the world, one day of being down in an LNG plant is $100 million of cost because you can't produce anything. So the idea in these operations of being able to guarantee production with no, no efficiency lost is really a different business model in the future. So I think this is how companies are rethinking what they sell and how they sell in the physical world to add digital. Without digital, you can't guarantee anything around the belt. With digital, you can change your model and generate increased profits and make your customers have a deeper relationship with you. For GE, we learned that this requires some technology. And if you don't know the technology, you, you can't do this. And the technology in the industrial world is I need to connect machines and pull data off and understand their performance. So we've developed this technology to an connect machines, develop, integrate machines, analyze them, get the reliability. You also need to automate the services that the people do. And so we've developed technology to automate how people work in the system. And then you have to have technology to collect this data and, and get the insight and deliver it. And what we've learned in the industrial space is we are moving from a world that people used to tell machines what to do in every plant in the world. The future will be a machine will tell a person what to do. And this is foundationally different. And this is going to change your work processes. But I'll just give an example. A self-driving car, today when you buy a car, the person tells the car what to do. In a self-driving car, the, no, the person doesn't tell the car. The car tells the person when they've arrived. It's a foundationally different business model. Now, if you like to drive, you won't like it. But that's going to happen everywhere because people can't process all this data and act fast enough. So the wind turbines that we've done that generate 5% more electricity with software, they operate without the people changing the control systems. And the control systems tell the people what they've done. A Couple of final thoughts. In any business today, we throw most, in the industrial world, we throw most of our data away. We keep all the data like how much we got paid, what's in order, who's on our payroll. The really valuable data we almost always throw away. We have 35,000 jet aircraft engines around the world. We have 70% of all commercial flights use our jet aircraft engines. We used to throw away all the data about how it performs. Now we keep every piece of data that comes off of every jet aircraft engine so that we can optimize the performance going forward. Because you'd have to look at the performance of it in the past to understand how it goes forward. And now we have new, new things we can do to help our customers operate their businesses better. The question is, what data are you throwing away that may be valuable to the new kinds of services you're going to have in the future? Go back to that belt. If I have the best data on a belt and I understand how it works, I am the one who can decide when to replace the belt at the optimal time. And that's why I can offer that service. Every one of you has unique data 
and domain expertise that if you can figure out how to combine it, you can compete in this digital world in a new way. As we look at the world, every industrial firm is going to have to transform itself. It's going to have to think about connecting assets, getting insight in how those assets operate, and telling people how to operate more efficiently. And this is a very simple model, but it's the model we think is the future, is the ability to do this, whether I've got a factory, whether I have a ser installation service, and we're doing this with companies who make a bath and kitchen fixtures, and they are optimizing and the, the idea of how they decide which person to send to which job in real time. And if I can do that, I can generate 20 to 30% efficiency on my field personnel because I'm looking at how I optimize that on the data. And I'm optimizing who I send to what jobs in a way I never did before. These are the kinds of, of things that we've seen people able to do. So if you just take a Joy Global in the uh, mining business, they're seeing 100% return on investment uh, in, in maintenance optimization. In other words, when they've uh, implemented these concepts, it paid for itself almost immediately. In, in less than a year, they were making money off of the ability to optimize all of their maintenance. We see uh, British Petroleum doing it on offshore oil platforms. And the ability to generate 2 to 4 percent more, uh, produce 2 to 4 percent more oil on an offshore oil platform, which is worth a lot of money to them. We see the idea of um, Crystal, their ability to uh, identify and fix 56% of their failures have gone away. These are the kinds of numbers I think we see that every business either has to do for themselves, but also they could probably help their customers with. Last chart, and then this is the time for you to think of questions, because I'll, I'll answer any questions you may have, is as we look at what does it take, the technology is not the hard part. It's the easy part. These three things are the hardest things I learned at GE. Leadership, talent, and culture. If you don't get these right, you cannot do this. Let me start with leadership. Leadership is two things. You have to have your leadership that doesn't understand digital decide what the strategy is. They have to lead from the top and say, we are committed to a digital strategy. They have to understand everything I just said and say, we have to have digital in there. And then they have to make sure that digital leaders are in place and non-digital leaders understand why it's important. So it, is, it has to be led as a business strategy, not a technology strategy. It's not done by the IT department. It's done by the business leaders who must own this. And if they don't own it as part of their strategy, it will not work. And you must understand that you probably don't have every, uh, all the right leaders. So sometimes you have to bring in leaders from the outside who have the right talent and make them work within your existing culture. And blending those together can be very difficult. The second thing is talent. You probably uh, don't have the right talent. A lot of us want to turn this into an IT project. That was the worst thing. You, this is a business project, and it must be done by digital people, but in the business. The business has to own it. Uh, you know, Uber doesn't have their IT people build Uber. They have digital people who own the business who, who put this together. And the second thing is this. The digital people aren't good enough by themselves to create this. Your, biz, your existing people must own this as well. So you have to hire what we would say are digital natives, people who understand it. But you must be con committed to your own people becoming digital migrants. They must be able to learn the technology. Let me give an example of these two. If you go to your supply chain leader and say, what are your digital initiatives to take 20% out of your supply chain, they probably have none. Or they probably don't even know what that means. Because they don't understand what digital can do. The same thing was true of taxi services. 
they didn't understand what digital could do, so they didn't create Uber. And then Uber came along, and Grab and others, and they put them at a disadvantage. Why didn't a taxi company create it? They had the data, they had the domain knowledge, but they didn't have the talent to be able to understand this. So you want your supply chain leader to be digital so that they could understand what programs to put in place and work with digital people to create these. The last thing is culture. Your culture has to change to be able to embrace the technology instead of being afraid of the technology and understand that this is a change. Because what is going to happen is you're going to go to an autonomous factory. You're going to, you are going to change jobs. Some jobs don't exist. And the reality is you have to be willing to make those shifts in order to become an efficient you know, business. So we've learned these are much harder. And I could spend the whole time on this. So with that said, you know, I, I'll end and then open it for questions for a few minutes. The world is one where the people who can build these digital te technologies are going to develop new kinds of services and business models. And you may find yourself, we could find ourselves developing, uh, providing jet aircraft engines. But it could be they no longer need our services. You have to think about what could undermine your business. And it may seem impossible. It seemed impossible to taxi services that could be undermined through a piece of software by a company who owns no taxis and makes more money and is more valuable than they will ever be. It seemed impossible that hotels would ever find they had a company they competed with. The most valuable hotel companies don't own any rooms. They just own a bunch of software. It seemed incredible that a retailer who had no physical space could be significantly more valuable than a company who's made more profit in one year than they've made in their entire existence. So this is the problem we face as we move forward as existing firms is to make this shift to innovate around this. So with that, I thought I could take a few minutes and answer any questions you have, but hopefully you could see something here and take away the think about your own business and where it's going. So let me open it up to any questions anyone may have. Hi. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for a very nice presentation. It's so inspiring. And um, I, I've seen a lot of you know, new ideas from, from your presentations. and. Um, Many things just intriguing me in, in terms of having uh, transformations to uh, our uh, production. My, actually, my business is in paint and coating, yes. producing paint. We, we can see some tangible things that digitalize in our manufacturing uh, process, something that could help to boost up the, the performance, efficiencies of the machines. That's something's easy. That's the first phase that you, you just yeah. put on your journey. But my question is, um, when we go through the journey until the very last part, which is to the market, yeah. how can we see that uh, 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 that evolution could modify our business into the digitalized uh, a new world of service? This is something that is quite intangible for us. Um, let's say if you say Uber is, is, is a different business, we can see a sample. Yeah. But in some other business that still far from that you know, yeah. point that we can reach that kind of service. How can we work together with the suppliers like GE or any anywhere we can find a new ideas of of inspiring to, to have that end? Yeah. So we could be more confident to do the investment to the beginning. Yeah. This is how people or yeah. business per, uh, men are reluctant to do the investment if they don't see the end. Yeah. They only know that how they could improve their uh, productivity and save a cost, but that's, that's not the whole story. We need to create more value into the, uh, our business. Yeah. How this going to go? Could you uh, yeah. give us a little so more? I, 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 I'd say a couple of things. One is, um, uh, the, you know, first of all, when GE started this, there was, there was nothing out there. There's no recipe book for this. There's recipe books for a lot of things, not in business, but not this. And I think that that's the troubling part to an existing business. Um, one of the things, you know, just uh, you know, a few words. 
about GE Digital that we've done is taken what we've learned and created a business to enable others. So the reason I'm here is we have uh, industrial firms here who we're working with on that industrial journey, both with the technologies they need, but also with the, the processes and helping them think through it. The, 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 when I showed the slide with the three levels, that we've discovered for ourselves and for others it's important because you have to get value on day one and you have to be willing to go on a journey, which many companies are they're afraid that they don't know the final blueprint, right? Industrial firms all want a final blueprint, right? And, and I think that you have to be willing to go on the journey, but you have to see a return early enough. So that's why we always start with the internals of the machines because what that does is it builds confidence that you can actually do these things and you can get value out of it. The second thing it does is it opens up then to get to operations, but you can also begin to explore. And I think the only thing you, you have to realize is this is a, is a journey in exploration and you have to be willing to change fast. Because if you take Uber as a good example, when they started, they were one of the least successful companies on the planet. They built software to manage limousine services and they made no money and nobody used it. I mean, a few people used it, but they realized that there wasn't big enough for them to do anything. So then they, they, the taxi was quite accidental. They got into it and even the original service didn't look like it did today. It had all kinds of, uh, they thought they were managing taxis, but then when the, the key was they figured out, I'll just open it up to everybody. Well, that's a leap of faith, by the way. But my point of that is they made two mistakes before they got to the right one. And they had to go on a learning journey for the business models. The problem is the business models aren't there. So you have to be able and willing to do this at a price point that you're not spending a billion dollars, a little bit, you're learning and you're able to change. So if you go on the journey we showed for an industrial firm, you're immediately saving money, which makes everybody happy. You're investing in building capabilities. You're trying out some new business models and you're pivoting or changing them as you go along. And the good news is nobody else has the business model. So you have five years, 10 years to go win this. And, and by the way, your competitors are no better off than you. They don't have the secret recipe book either. So this is a foot race. Whoever's able to learn, you don't need the smartest team. You need the best learning team. Because what you do is you learn as you go. So by starting with your own internal operations, which you know how to do, you can win. By testing the waters with other things and moving through this, you can get to a point where you figure out the business model before your competitor and get it out there. And that's what we see. I gave the rubber company example. It, it, you know, they didn't know exactly what the business model was. I mean, they had to explore it with their customers. And then they found something that is, is quite innovative and different. So I think that this is, uh, it's not something that gives you great comfort that there isn't a recipe. The good news is if you figure out the recipe in your first, you always win. And, and so I think those are things to think about. And by the way, you don't have to be in Silicon Valley to win this. That's what I'm saying is you can be anywhere in the world now the way the technology is. And you can either win your country, your region, but you can take this global. And that's what we're seeing with companies as well. Was there a question? Thank you very much for your presentations. My name is O from Food, first and food business. Yes, I would like to ask you three questions. First, would you compare your feelings between your stay in China on 2016 and Thailand stay here? Okay. And second question, what is the key of success for the CIO positions in business transformations? Okay. And third question, what kind of business in Thailand for you looking in GE digital transform machines? Okay. Please don't reply like us or business. Thank you. <laughs> so he, he's getting his money's worth out of questions, first of all. Uh, so the first one I think was Thailand, Ch compared Thailand, China. Um, so I've been at, China was one of the first countries I started working on this digital journey with. And so really, I uh, started there about 2013. We, we started working with a lot of 
uh, early companies and, and running pilots. It's, it's um, I'd say three things I saw that, you know, I give the same advice when I'm in Kazakhstan and uh, Vietnam and other countries is that I saw the, uh, their um, MIDI, which is their uh, technology uh, ministry, as being, uh, as being thoughtful to ensure, um, so first of all, the regulators in the government are thinking about how to enable the businesses to want to do this. So the, it, it, the regulations don't get in the way. They actually are thinking about how the regulations can support it. And the best countries in the world are, are thinking about how they enable through regulations. So I'll give a good example. If your uh, power industry is highly regulated, you might find you cannot use any of this technology because the regulations may say you can't connect something or you can't share the data or the, you know, there's a lot of little regulations that can actually get in the way. And so I think one is, uh, you know, uh, I think is uh, the ability to have that kind of, uh, of, of government industry relationship I think is important for the, uh, in other words, for the country to be able for all businesses to rise in the country. So they don't think about one business. They just think about how can I enable the, all those businesses. They have a policy, and I give them a lot of credit for the way they're thinking. I think the second, and so as a result, all the businesses in the country feel like there's, that uh, you know, they're being cheered on to do this. So they're thinking about it. And I think what happens is most businesses I don't sense in Thailand that, you know, that it's across all businesses people think about it today because they don't know about it. So, uh, but what is happening, I think, here is we see uh, individual businesses with very forward, thoughtful leaders who have read and learned beginning to think about it. But the question is, how do you do that at a country level so everybody, all boats can rise? Because I think this can be a form of competition for, uh, for a country like Thailand. Um, to go forward into the future. So when I look at, I, I think what differentiates is the government is there, they're encouraging it through regulation, they're also encouraging it because they're providing money to universities and, and so you have kids coming out of the university who are encouraged to have the right background so you have talent to come in. Um, and then, uh, I, I, so that's one, you know, those are two things I see. The third thing I would say is this, that. However, when I do go around and I look at the manufacturers, the one thing is, you know, when you have been competing on low-cost labor, it's hard for you to see how to do this. But, and you think that low-cost labor is going to be the answer forever. And so I think the one thing is it's not like they, across the board, believe the change is necessary. So even the management has to be taught so it's not like they're way ahead because within this world, the thinking on low-cost labor is driving, uh, questioning whether they should be doing this. So I don't know whether they'll make the shift fully in their manufacturing base, but at the government level, they want to make that happen. At, in, you know, I think in Thailand, those are things the country at the government level has to pursue. And then you know, the question is, will the companies want to do that to be able to entice the next generation. Because I think the next generation retailers are going to go to countries with not low cost manufacturing, but high quality automated manufacturing will probably be the nature of the future. Um, the nature of the CIO is this. CIOs in the world today have been trained to make your networks work, your ERPs run, um, build uh, some level of applications. But the reality is the CIO is going to have to foundationally change their mindset from a buyer of technology and, and program management capabilities to a developer. Because this is not a, there's no package to do this. You have to buy, I mean, you can come to a place like GE and buy the base technology, but you have to have great analytics talent. You have to have great uh, data scientists who can build these algorithms. And most IT shops aren't yet set up to do this. So CIOs have to move from being CIOs who manage operations and ERPs to enabling the business through development, through analytics, and the ability to work with a business leader on business strategy. And those talents are often not in the traditional CIOs. Now some do have it, but finding those who can work with the advanced technology and do development, 
that is the role of the CIO is going to change into a chief digital officer who is able to do this kind of development. But it's very hard for a traditional CIO always to make the change. And I think that this, the, you know, these are actually three great questions. This may be the hardest thing in the organization, is how do you organize? Where do you get the talent? Who do you do some, a, a CDO separate from a CIO? These are really complicated questions for organizations to make, and there's no recipe. There's a lot of different um, things being done. Within um, what I'm excited, the reason I'm here is, uh, I mean, the main reason, other than talking to all of you, is, um, is I'm here because we're, I'm visiting uh, several uh, customers who are actually quite advanced in their thinking and already started the journey of uh, organizing their digital capability. They usually have a very specific group within it. They're building, uh, and so we're working on projects. And what, what's, they're at that first stage, I'd say. Everyone is at the, the productivity level, but every one of the customers we're working with here they get, they, they get the business model, and the question about the business model, they don't ex know exactly how the business model is going to change, but they know they're going to get there. So I think what I'm excited about here is <coughs> uh, we've got some great opportunities. Now, so I'm, I'm, build, I'm you know, dedicating a resource to build a business in Thailand because I see that this may be a place that um, embraces this. Uh, to a level that allows it to compete, you know, on a, a regional and global level better. So I'm excited about being here. I'm excited about the way people are thinking here. Any, uh, let's see, I know probably one more question. Is that it? Or what? One more question? Okay. Um, just like to say that very appreciate that you're coming today because I'm very excited from last week knowing from Dr. Sony that you're going to be here and chat us about you. your uh, digital journey and especially your presentation today. Um, for, for the last presentation, you shared with us about the lesson learned from the digital journey in GE. One more question that I I still like to know from your transformation that about the man, manpower. And if your your staff, I mean your employee, cannot go with you with the digital with your digital journey, yeah. what have you done with you with them, and uh, yeah. what is your manpower planning for this? Boy, this is this uh, this is um, this is an important question. We started. We didn't know how this was going to work out. There's two things I just would tell you about. The first thing is uh, when we looked at our technical talent, and we and over seven years. Um, now that I look back. We had to replace about 30% of our technical talent because they did not have the skill set for the future. And that part alone isn't the problem. The second thing is they didn't learn. They didn't really want to learn. So if I have somebody who doesn't have the talent but they're willing to learn, I can, I can get them to the right place. So the way to think about it is about one third of our talent had good skills and could fit in this modern world. One third didn't have the right skills, but they would learn. And I can help them get there if they want to learn. The other third didn't want to learn and didn't have the right skills. Every day they came to work and said, I still want to deal with my COBOL program or whatever. And we still need some of those, but we need less of those and more of these. And so the ability to do talent management and move uh, and decide this became a key part of what, what we had to do. And the second thing is, you, but you got to know what talent you need. And so we did a lot of work about what kind of skill sets we would need. And then we, the second thing we did is we built a talent management system. So every one of our tech employees fills out a self-assessment. So nobody assesses them. They fill it out. And so what it, that was used for to look at what skills did we have. And there were some surprising things we discovered. We thought we would need to hire more analytics people. Turned out we have good analytics skills. So we felt we were more comfortable about that. We wanted to cheer that on. On cybersecurity, we found out we had nowhere near the talent in cybersecurity. We found out we had more project managers 
than development managers, meaning most of our people were good at hiring an outside consulting firm to come in and implement a system, rather than being good at hiring developers and building high-valued new services inside our company we could make money off of. So we realized we had too many project managers and not enough development managers. And so this allowed us to begin to tell people individually, here's where your skill set is. These are the skills we need. Here is online training. Go for it. And that's why we began to know who was going to go for it and who wasn't. The, the other thing we could do is at the top level, we knew we needed more cybersecurity so we could begin to target hiring them because they're very hard to find. So we now have a complete assessment of 25,000 people that allows them to have an individual program to figure out what they should be doing. We provide them online training and a lot of tools. But with that said, I, I think you begin to find not everybody's going to make it and you do have to transition. The hard part is making sure you hire the right talent going forward because every time you hire somebody, you know, that's got to fill a gap and not be something you already have a lot of. And so that's helped us and it's taken about five years to get to a, the place we are. So it didn't happen overnight, but you can manage your talent and bring them through this. That's a great question. So look, um, I think uh, I'm at my, my time, a little past my time. Uh, I want to thank you all, and uh, I, I wish you well on your journey, and hopefully I've left you with something to think about, uh, a way to think about your business going forward. So thank you very much, and uh, uh, thank you for your time. Okay, uh, thank you, Bill, a lot for a great speech today, and we learned a lot about the digital uh, journey of GE, and. Please give a big applause to him again. And actually, we have a gift for, uh, and also I would like to introduce our GE team to, today we have a GE team from uh, China. Mr. Alvin Ng. Singapore, I'm sorry, Singapore. Mr. Ados Wong from China. And Kunjira Panpong Panit from GE Thailand. And Kun Gowit from GE Thailand. Actually, our GE team would like to, you know, uh, take a picture with us and also please give applause to Mr. Bill again for a great speech and motivating speech. <laughs> and I would like to uh, invite Dr. Tanawat Ponrishai, the director of TEPCOT, to give a gift to Mr. Bill and GE team. Okay. Mr. Adels Wong, and also uh, Mr. Alvin Ng and Kun Pan and Kun And couldn't go with him. And also, we would like to take a picture with our Mr. Bill. Uh, can you stand? Uh, yes, yes, we will take a picture. Also, GE team. 
แอนพี่ๆค่ะขยับมาตรงกลางได้ไหมคะยืนยืนเลยค่ะยืนแอนพี่ๆค่ะพี่ๆเรียนเชิญนะคะอ่าโอเคน้องก้อยขาพี่เปิ้ลแถวเข้าเลยค่ะพี่นัทวุฒิ